Now that we have a pretty good idea of the major problems Redux was created to solve, namely props drilling, state sharing, and global state chaos, let's take a look at how it actually works. While the name Redux might intimidate a lot of people, as names that end in X tend to do, it's actually a fairly straightforward concept and process. Earlier, we learned about both the benefits and, perhaps more importantly, the rather crippling drawbacks of having a single unrestricted global state that's accessible by all of our components. That being said, one of the core concepts of Redux is that we have one central global state called the store that all our components can access. Now this store is essentially a big JSON object that serves as a single source of truth for all of our components, and in theory it can hold any kind of data that we need it to, although in practice there are some things that are better off without it, but that's a discussion for another time. So for example, our Redux store can hold data about the user, such as whether or not the user is logged in, the user's name, age, and bio, and whatever other data we might load from the server. It could also hold things like a list of products on an e-commerce site, or a list of articles on a blog site. Basically anything that we load from a server or any internal application state that we need to keep track of can be put into the Redux store. So the next question here is, since Redux uses a global state, how does it prevent the chaos inherent in this approach? Well, the problem with a global state isn't the fact that it's global per se. The problem is that there's no good way to control the access and modification of this global state by pretty far-flung parts of the application. This means that with an unrestricted global state, any part of our application can make whatever changes it wants to the global state basically without any restriction whatsoever. So we'd be relying on all of our components to be good stewards of this state and change it in predictable ways, which, from a software development standpoint, is a very naive assumption. So, in order to see how Redux solves this problem, let's take a look at the two other pieces of the Redux flow. We've already talked about the Redux store, which contains the current state of our application, but in addition, we have Redux actions, and something called reducers. Let's discuss both of these in turn. Redux actions are JSON objects consisting of two things. An action type, which is basically just a string naming the action, and a payload of additional data. The purpose of Redux actions is to explicitly define the different events that can occur in our application. So for example, we could have an action with the type user data loaded, with a payload that contains the actual user data that we just fetched from the server. Or we could have an action with the type item added to cart, with a payload that contains the ID of the item that the user just added to their shopping cart. Now obviously the number of possible actions in an application can be pretty large, but the point here is that we're explicitly defining them instead of just leaving it to chance. So that's actions. Reducers, on the other hand, are Redux's way of specifying what should happen to our Redux store, our central state, when a given action occurs. So using our example from before, we might say that when a user data loaded action occurs, we set the user property in the Redux store to the user data that's in the action's payload. Or when an item added to cart action occurs, we add whatever item is in the payload to the array of items in the shopping cart property of our Redux store. So the key point to know here is this. Our components are only allowed to make changes to the state by triggering these predefined actions, and the only changes to the state that are allowed to take place in our application are the corresponding changes that we specify in our reducers. This all gives rise to what's referred to as a unidirectional data flow. In other words, we end up with a cycle that looks something like this. The UI triggers an action, that action is reduced to get the new updated state, and the components in our application get read-only access to that updated state. We'll go into more detail about this in videos that follow, including what this all looks like in code and how components can access our store and trigger actions. Now that we know what problems Redux is meant to solve and the basic concepts behind how it works, let's walk through the process of actually adding Redux to our project. As a matter of fact, Adding Redux to our project is really a simple process with only a few steps. So the first thing we're going to do is actually install Redux into our project. And to do that, we just need to open up a terminal inside our directory and run npm install 
Redux and React-Redux and hit enter. And once we've done that, the next thing we're going to do is create a new file inside our source directory called store.js. This is where we're going to put our logic for setting up our Redux store. So we'll say store.js. And for now, this file is going to be pretty simple. We'll add more stuff to it as we create our actual reducers and add new ecosystem tools to our project. First, we're going to import two things from Redux. We're going to say import create store and combine reducers from Redux. And then down below that, we're going to define an empty object called reducers. So const reducers equals empty object. This is where we'll put all the reducers that we define later on, but for now it's just going to be an empty object. So once we've done that, we have to use the combine reducers function that we imported to create what's called a root reducer. So we'll say const root reducer equals combine reducers reducers. And all this does is put our reducers into a form that we can pass to the create store function that we imported. So what we're going to do down here is export a function called configure store. We'll say export const configure store. And it's going to simply return create store called with the root reducer we created. And that's all the setup we need inside our store.js file for now. The next thing we need to do is open up our index.js file and wrap our whole app inside what's called the Redux provider. So let's open up index.js. And the first thing we've got to do is import our provider. So we'll say import provider from React Redux. And we also need to import the configure store function that we just defined in our store.js file. So we'll say import configure store from store. And then inside this react-dom.render function, we're going to wrap our app component with this provider and pass our configured store into it. And that's going to look like this. We're going to wrap our app component in the provider. And to this provider component, we're going to pass a store prop. And we're going to pass configure store called. And then we're just going to put this app component inside the provider here. And that's all the basic setup we have to do for now. The next step for us is to create our actions and reducers. And once we've done that, we'll come back to our store configuration and see how everything fits together. Now that we've performed the basic setup to add Redux to our React app, we're going to actually create some actions and reducers that our application can use to help keep track of its state. In this video, we're going to start off by defining some Redux actions. So the first thing we're going to do is create a new file inside of our source slash to-do directory, and we'll call it actions.js. And then inside this file, we're going to define a create to do action that our app will fire whenever the user types something into the new to do form component that we created and presses the create to do button. We'll see how this all fits together later. So we saw in a previous video that every action is essentially just a JSON object with a type property and possibly a payload. And because of this, we're going to start off by creating a constant for the actions type. We're going to say export const create to do all capital snake case and that's going to be equal to just the string create to do and once we've done that we're going to create the actual action that our components can dispatch now our first instinct might be to say something like export const create to do equals type create to do something like that just exporting a json object but as we'll see later on this action is going to need to have a payload as well, which will contain the text of the new to-do. So instead of just exporting a JSON object, what we're going to do instead is export a function that takes this extra info as an argument and returns an action object with this info as the payload. So what does that look like in code? Well, we're going to say export const create to-do equals text, and this is going to be a function that simply returns an object with the type create to do that we created and the payload 
will be an object with the property text. And that'll contain the text of the new to-do when we trigger it. So again, the idea is that when we trigger this action from our components, we're going to just call this create to-do function like this, and pass it the text of the new to-do. Now, there's a name for functions like this that create our action objects for us. They're called action creators. And notice I didn't say it was a very creative name. The nice part about using action creators is that they abstract away all the actual code for the actions. As we'll see later on, inside our components, it's much easier and less error prone to simply use these action creators than to explicitly code out the action objects. And for this reason, in React Redux applications, we work almost exclusively with action creators instead of using bare actions, even when a given action doesn't even have a payload. In this case, we would still create an action creator, it just wouldn't have any arguments. So that's our first Redux action type and action creator that we'll be making use of when the user enters a new to-do item and clicks create to-do. What we're going to want also is an action type and action creator for when a user wants to remove an item. And here's what that'll look like. We'll start off by creating another action type. We'll say export const remove to-do equals remove to-do. And then we're going to define the remove to-do action creator. Note that in a coming video, we're going to make it so that the create to-do form prevents users from entering duplicate to-do item text. So for now, we can just use the text of a to-do item as a unique identifier to delete it. Not necessarily ideal, but for now that'll work just fine. So our remove to-do action creator is going to look like this. Export const remove to-do equals, and then we're going to be using the text as the unique identifier, and the type of the action we create is going to be remove to-do, and the payload will simply be an object with the to-do's text that we want to remove. And that's all there is to it. We've got our first two action types and action creators. In a little while, we'll go into more detail about how to actually use these. 